thank you everyone for being here on a Monday evening. <laughs> I really appreciate it and thank you to my fellow panelists for agreeing to um, be here with me. Um, so this is an uh, art and activism panel or something to that effect. I'll be saying more about that in a few. But uh, my fellow panelists here, fellow authors, we've done a lot of panels. We've done a lot of these talks. And I've been on both sides, uh, being a panelist and being in the audience. And I always found myself wanting to know more about my fellow art, uh, authors. Uh, Twitter, Twitter gives us an inkling. Um, our books give us an inkling in terms of who we are as people in this world. But um, I, I, think, I really think that's just a fraction of the space that we take up. So I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to define themselves, to name themselves, and let us know who you really are as a human being, as a human becoming in this world, as a writer, as a public intellectual, as an artist. So um, of course, uh, Lily so graciously shared our bios with us, but oftentimes our bios don't really reflect uh, our identities. I think they list our accolades, our stars, uh, you know, the lists or what have you. But please, let's start with whomever and name, uh, name yourself, define yourself, and tell us who you really are within the context of the work that you do. Take it away, somebody, anybody. My name is Joseph, or the Peace One. I'm a member of the Abenaki Nation, the Mohegan Tribal Nation. And uh, as a writer and a storyteller, um, I begin with breath, which is why I play this flute. That which brings us all together, which we all share, wherever we're from, wherever we are. And I hope that my work has that ability to contact, to connect with, and to be absorbed by, to some degree, those who read it. And as a writer and a storyteller, I try to be as truthful as possible, even in fantasy, to those things that are basic to our common humanity, the heartbeat, the breath, the fact that we all have two ears and one mouth and have to listen twice as much as we talk, which means I've said enough for now. <laughs> Thank you so much for setting the tone, Joseph. <laughs> I'm Emily XR Pan. Um, as my bio brushed upon, I am a child of immigrants. My parents moved here from Taiwan in the 80s. I identify as both Taiwanese and Chinese, which gets to be a little bit of a politically complicated thing. Um, I always lived in white dominated communities growing up. So I was born in the Midwest, I moved all around growing up and every time I would find myself in a neighborhood in a school that was primarily white and that really affected how I defined myself. I considered myself to be extremely intensely Chinese and proud of my heritage and then went to college and met all these Asian kids who felt that I didn't belong because I was too white. So that's a, a big part of my identity and what I strive to uh, bring into my characters in my writing. I like to straddle the lines of how we identify ourselves, where we place ourselves in the world, um, how to find ourselves, what's important to us, and what it means to be in touch with one's heritage. Um, that's a lot of what's in my book. I'm also a raging feminist, as I think most of us are on this panel. I would hope all of us are. Um, I am Corinne, I am black, I am queer, I'm trans, I'm from the Caribbean. It's a lot of identities, a lot of marginalizations. Um, I strive to write about as many of them as I can in each novel to create more visibility for uh, people who remind me of myself and who don't get to see themselves enough in books. 
I am Danielle Clayton. I am black. I am a descendant of American chattel slavery. I grew up in the Washington DC suburbs, but I was raised by very Southern parents from Mississippi and from North Carolina. I was raised in a very, very, very Christian household, but I am a very outspoken, I guess, what's the other thing, agnostic person <laughs> um, who might think there's some energy but is still questioning. Um, I call myself casually queer because it's nobody's business but mine and I do what I wanna do. Um, let's see, I try to write about, I also grew up in mostly white environments, so I grew up sort of the fly in the milk and sort of loud and grumpy and um, mad. And I try to write girls um, that break the rules and have big mouths and do what they want to do and try to break sort of the monolith and some of the definitions that we put on what it means to be black American. I really want to write in other stories into what that box looks like. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I am, I am black, I am Haitian American, I am a mother, I'm a very black mama. Um, <laughs> and it comes with a whole lot of rules. I am um, cisgendered, married for 17 years. Um, I am African-centered, uh, and that means that I, I reach back for something very, very old, for, to, for, for tradition and culture. I have not fully assimilated to American culture. And in that vein, I want to just ask you uh, a question, um, Joseph. I, I really feel like you set the tone for me personally in terms of honoring tradition and honoring culture first and foremost, and talking about the storyteller as a, as a giver of life, as a giver of breath, and an, as a keeper and custodian of culture. Now, um, one of the things, something happened uh, a few months ago, I think earlier this year, we were at the Qu Quayle Conference, if anybody has heard of the QuaileCon, K-W-E-L-I, look it up, a very important conference for uh, writers, aspiring writers of color. Um, oftentimes when people ask me what's my favorite book, I don't usually share what my favorite book actually is because nobody has heard of it. Uh, my favorite novel in the whole wide world is a book called 2000 Seasons by Ayikwe Arma. <laughs> And I heard you mention Aikwe Ama earlier this year, and that was a very validating moment for me because here's something that I kept to myself thinking that no one shares that, and then I find myself in a children's book conference, and you, as an elder, as a custodian of culture, know, not only knows what, know what book I'm talking about, but you shared some time and space with Aikwe Ama as well. Um, and 2000 season is about young people. Um, they're about to be captured by slaves in West Africa, and it's their journey away from the coast of West Africa back to the interior, and what breaks them, what pulls them apart and brings them back together again. It's very epic, and it was published in 1966. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, from 1966 to 1969, I was a teacher in Ghana, West Africa. And my experience in Ghana was truly life-changing because about the first year I was in Ghana, I began meeting writers, people like Ai Koyarma, Kofi Awunor, who tragically was killed by um, Boko Haram in an attack on a, um, a mall in Kenya a couple of years ago, a very dear friend of mine. And I discovered in Africa, one day I realized, I was looking at the students in my secondary school and saying, oh my goodness, you look just like a friend of mine I went to school with who was blonde and blue-eyed. And the person I was looking at was a Ghanaian person with dark skin, but I was seeing beyond that color of the skin, that mask that has blinded so many people in this culture to the basic humanity of all of us. So dealing with African writers, seeing African stories, living in an African context made me understand who I was as a person as a Native person, a Native American, wanting to tell the stories of my people. So that when I read a novel called Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, I knew that was a path I had to follow, to write as Chinua did. And the fact that Chinua would later be on my PhD committee and become a dear friend was a special bonus for me. 
But we as people, I honestly believe, owe it to ourselves to understand our own background, that deep background that Ayakwe Arma wrote about, a story no one had told before, and also to see the journeys that we can take our readers on. I want to take the young people who read my books on journeys that will help them see themselves, but also see the lives of others, truly as other human beings, not as curiosities or foreigners, not as people to keep out, but people to embrace in many different ways. I think that's all I need to say right now. Thank you so much. So that was a serendipitous, magical moment for me that I didn't tweet about or share. It's one of those things that I, I've had several moments like that, and those moments mean more to me than the stars and the applause and the accolades. Those are great too, but those, uh, those nods from the universe are validating. Do you all have tiny moments, magical moments, nods from the universe that let you know that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing? I think when I visit my P.O. box and I get mail, handwritten letters from kids that say, I loved these things in your book, or this was just like me. Are you spying on me? This is my life. Um, that's when I realize that I'm tapping into something that, that they need, a texture, a story, where they feel seen. They feel like their story matters, their lives matter. And that's when I realized, okay, I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I was a teacher for a long time. So I was sort of the sun in little people's universes for a while and I craved sort of being able to have that connection. And I think the letters are the ways that I think the universe reminds me that you're still in contact with them. You're still doing this work. It's different, you're out of the classroom, but you're still giving them those breadcrumbs that they need to, for nourishment. For me, it's something, it's something similar, um, having readers reach out and react to something in my book that, you know, for example, um, something random, I mean, like the mother of the character in The Astonishing Color of After dies and then turns into a bird. And I can't tell you how many messages I've gotten from people who swear that, you know, at the funeral of this loved one, they saw a bird and they knew that that bird was the one who had passed. Um, and also things like, I had been afraid to lean into the Buddhism um, in my book. I was raised Buddhist, and I mean, if you visit Taiwan, where parts of the book are set in Taiwan, if you walk down a street in Taiwan, it's, there's just, there are temples everywhere. You can, even if you're a Christian, even if you're not Buddhist, you're going to pass Taoist temples, Buddhist temples, and I ended up capturing that and then worrying that it would maybe be alienating, that people would be like, oh, I'm reading about something very foreign to me. I've gotten so many messages from people being talking about pastors and churches and ceremonies that are totally not Buddhist, but they connected with the spirituality of it. And that's felt really important. That's been, I think, extremely validating to know that I've been able to make a human connection through my work. Um, for me, uh, very recently at the um, Boston Book Festival, an author came up to me, um, and they haven't been published yet. They're at the very beginning of their journey. They haven't started querying just yet. Um, their name is Lynn Thompson. And they started, they were just excited to see another transgender author. Um, my books don't have any transgender characters, but they started to talk to me about their idea of writing a transgender middle grade character. And they started getting emotional because they were crying, so I started to cry as well. Um, <laughs> They were saying, just seeing you here um, gave me the, the, the courage to uh, continue on my journey. And that reminded me of um, Alex Gino and seeing them. And that ha gave me the courage to come out as transgender as well and be an author in this community. So I think that was one of the most validating experiences. I'm thinking of an experience that I had uh, perhaps uh, 15 years ago. Uh, a book of mine was published called The Way, which is about a uh, boy trying to learn martial arts from his uncle, and uh, another student brings a gun to the school. And a school shooting is about to happen, and this kid has to figure out a way to do it, but even though he's studied martial arts, as I've done for 40 years, uh, he doesn't use violence to solve the situation. So I was invited to Pearl, Mississippi, not long after the shooting that took place there, and I was given the key to the city. 
and they said they'd been reading my book. And to make it even sweeter, the principal, who was an African-American, came up to me and said, you may not remember me, but we were on the Meredith March together in Mississippi. And he is now the principal of a school that never allowed African-American kids to come as students. Ah, oh, I've got tears coming to my eyes right now. That kind of validating moment is really significant. And it really has very little to do with me as a writer. But the change that can happen in this country still, and will happen in this country still, is so validating. Thank you all. So I ask those uh, questions just to, for me, to humanize the people. I mean, we're human, but that we're, we, we have these private lives that we don't often share. And there are things that happen that we celebrate privately. Sometimes we share them publicly, but I just want to know that you have these moments to, to keep, that you keep to yourselves before you go out into the world and become these public figures. And along those lines, I want to shift gears and talk about the work that you do as activists and whether or not you do define yourselves as activists. But also before that, I was wondering that this is not, we are all diverse. We have diverse backgrounds. We write diverse books. Um, recently, very, re is it still a thing? Is D, diverse, D is for diversity a thing? So a, couple of, a few years ago, every panel was, a, every other panel was a diversity panel. Diversity, diversity, diversity. We celebrated diversity. We wanted diversity. Um, some people pushed back against diversity. I don't hear as, as much anymore, but what I'm hearing is activism. A is for activism. Activism, activism, activism. And by default, or maybe by design, the panels that are about activism are diverse. Is A is for activism a new buzzword? What do you think? Yes? Okay, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Can white people be activists? <laughs> I think it really depends on what you're being an activist about. I think being an acti activist is about trying to affect change in some way. And for us to be stepping out there and trying to affect change, I mean, it sets an example for anybody who feels that they are aligned with our same identity, whatever we're striving to do. Um, Sometimes for someone of greater privilege to step out and be an activist can be extremely powerful. You know, for someone white to come forward and be like, this is why Black Lives Matter is so important can say a lot to the other white people who maybe haven't like sat up and listened. So I think anyone can be an activist, but you have to be thoughtful about what you're, you have to be thoughtful and you have to be respectful to the identity for which you're trying to affect change. Uh, I have a troubling, <laughs> troubling thought. I think that with the D with diversity, um, when people are left out of what I've been calling marginalization manner, and they don't have a ticket to marginalization manner, they want to find their way. I don't want to be glib about it, but it feels that way. Well, if we're on an activism panel, then all of us can be activists. It doesn't matter if we come from diverse backgrounds. If you're an activist, it sort of is a wide swath. And so it's a new way to sort of become part of a movement and become part of the head of movements or come to the front line of a movement. And so I just think we should be careful when we replace D and diversity with A, with activism, be careful about sort of the co-opting of movements. And um, when people feel left out of the conversation, they create a new conversation so that they can sort of be in it. And so I just want us to be aware that this rebranding of this movement can also block a lot of people from engaging with but it. You do think it is sort of a rebranding? Yes, because I think that the word diversity also can make people feel sad or <laughs> I'm not diverse or I don't check these boxes. I remember one author when we first started this, uh, when I first was published said, oh, well, I check more boxes than you. And I was like, <laughs> okay. 
oppression Olympics. <laughs> um, and so it became the, well, what boxes do you check and how diverse are you? And, you know, now this is just the new, it's the new way to sort of rebrand the whole movement. I, I do, I 100% agree with that. Um, and that's something to be careful of because I have outright heard people say, well, how do we make space at the table without having to get up from the table? Like exactly. those sorts of concerns. So that's something to be wary of. But um, at the same time, I do also wonder if, um, you know, I've heard conversations around diversity 2.0 in the sense of we've had the conversations. They do need to continue to be had. But I think we have all, hope not everyone, hopefully most of us have gotten to a place where we understand that diversity is necessary. So I think the activism might be the, okay, so what's the next step? Like how do we create the change that's necessary so that we don't have to continue having these conversations. And now, J Joseph, um, I remember, I think when I first started trying to publish, which was about 15 years ago, it was M is for multiculturalism. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have, how, as, a, as someone who's been publishing for decades, what have you seen change, if anything at all? What, has there been any progress? Has the conversation shifted in any way? Well, it, it's kind of interesting because I've worn a lot of hats. I've also been a publisher of a small press. And at one point, I was, well, our, our little press called the Greenfield Review Press was a major publisher, the major publisher of African poetry in the United States, the major publisher of Asian American poetry in the United States, the major publisher of Native American poetry in the United States. We first published Leslie Silko's first book, for example. Um, and we didn't use the word multicultural back then. The word didn't exist. Because I was just, my wife, my late wife Carol and I, were just trying to publish work we thought was valid, wonderful, deserving of an audience, and often neglected. And that was what I was trying to do back then. Now I think there are so many options open to people but we have to be careful not to blur the lines and make that definition meaningless that we say, well, multiculturalism, well, it could include every single culture, yes, but some cultures have been included to the point of excluding everybody else. So finding that balance to me is, is very significant. I'm very grateful, for example, for the work that Jason Lowe, one of my publishers does with Lee and Lowe, read his essays. I was just saying that Jason should publish them as a book because he is really getting to the heart of what we need to consider in terms of this issue of inclusion, but not just inclusion for the sake of inclusion, but inclusion that truly recognizes common humanity, unique differences, and the necessity of having those voices heard. And not just heard by small communities, but heard by the world. We need to be heard by the world. And I've said that about American Indian literature and. 1992, we put together a thing called Returning the Gift, a festival of Native authors. We brought about 300 uh, Native American writers and storytellers from all over the, the uh, North and South American continents to Oklahoma for four days. And we said, we want to speak to the world, not just to each other. And I think that's really important to recognize. Now, um, you know what, what, what you were saying in terms of um, inclusion, not just for the sake of inclusion. I'm also thinking of, is this uh, publishing is a business, uh, we know that as well. Now should, M is for multiculturalism, D is for diversity, <laughs> A is for activism. Should those all be profitable in some way and profitable for whom? Can we be packaged and sold the work that we are doing? Um, could, be, could the revolution, whatever change we're looking for, could it be, could be packaged and put a, you know, put a black fist on the box? and um, sell it to the masses, and who profits from that ultimately? And does anything, anything get watered down in that process? Everything gets watered questions. down. <laughs> Everything gets watered down because it's the machine that is filled with whiteness, and anything that moves through the machine is going to be affected and diluted by that. So, you would have to burn the entire machine and rebuild the machine in order to do that and rebuild this entire country and its history and its economic system and the way it organizes everything. So 
it would be a lot of work to be done. But I do think that we can write against the machine and sort of dig our heels in and stet the hell out of copy editors who want to italicize words or oh, yeah. make you explain and sort of dismantle the white default. And there are ways that we as writers can have tools in our toolbox and equip ourselves with ways to fight against that machine that you're talking about. But I don't know. I think that's an important statement. Yeah, but I don't I know. Don't know. No, right? I don't know. Anyone want to add to that before I ask another question? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the commodification of anything corrupts it by nature. I mean, if you think about, um, for example, when there was the Women's March happening and then everyone started selling pussy hats mm -hmm. and suddenly everyone could go out and order a pussy hat from Etsy and you could wear that and call yourself an activist, right? How many, peop how many of those people were actually taking action? How many of those people were trying to affect change other than making themselves be visibly involved? And look and, cute. Right. And so what do we lose when things are commodified? And, and what do, you know, there is this huge conversation about, is diversity a trend? Hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully diversity is the reality of our world. It shouldn't be a trend. It's literally how we live and breathe. Um, but when you commodify it, then does that become like, oh, this is what's fashionable in publishing right now? And how do we sustain it beyond that? I think that's a really important question. The flip side of it is that the commodification maybe helps some of us rise up, but how temporary is that? I was going to say exactly the last part of what you said. is uh, It's a strange catch-22 because we actually kind of depend on it as well. Like uh, We as writers, we're hopefully being activists through our writing, but we need to get paid and to continue to be able to write. And to, we need to be published. We need to be paid by the publishers. And in a way, you know, the hate you get, for example, is I feel like the biggest symbol of this right now where it's making so much money, but it's also just like, create, like bashed open the doors for so many others. Um, like black writers, whereas before a lot of publishing companies might have said, oh, black people don't read, or, you know, unfortunately. Or there was a quota. Or there was a quota. Now suddenly there can be multiple black people on one list. So, you know, everything that you said, absolutely 100%, and that's how we still need to think about it, but we also, it's like a weird catch-22, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think back to uh, something that uh, De was sent, uh, Alice Papano, who was a head clan mother at Onondaga, a very dear friend and a teacher of mine said, she said, it's not that there's something wrong with money, it's that the wrong people have it. <laughs> and I think we need to think in those terms, it is okay for us as writers to make money from writing uh, out of our diverse or whatever experience. It's okay. We shouldn't feel guilty about that. But I think we have to be very aware that we need to keep taking steps, as you said. And even a small step is a step. And that's really significant to me. Wow, okay. <laughs> I think we have some answers here, like some real big picture ad answers. Uh, now, the thing I wanna, within this world of um, activism, within this world of speaking out and pushing against the machine, um, now I'm coming from when I identified myself as a black, black mama earlier, <laughs> this question comes from that center. Uh, meaning sometimes I, I'm, I'm not that old, but I, I am a woman of a certain age. <laughs> Um, and I'm a parent to two teenagers, t two vocal, opinionated teenagers. And sometimes when I look at young people, and when I say young, you could be an angsty teen at 50, you know, <laughs> or 70 something, as we know, um, someone who's running this country. Sometimes I just wanna, you know, and you know, sometimes you just hear these people yelling at the void, yelling at white supremacy, yelling at patriarchy. And um, as I said earlier to my fellow authors, um, there is this idea of being wrong and strong, right? Of being loud and not very well, thought, not very thoughtful, um, and not to invalidate what it is that you're saying, but there just needs to be a little bit more introspection. And sometimes I just wanna grab somebody by the ear and, sit, and say, sit down, baby, read a few books, <laughs> you know, think, um, just unpack certain things, would you say? <laughs> What you say, say it right now. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. Come here, baby. Have a seat. Here's some soup. Here's some chicken soup. You know, watch some TV. Reflect. Think about what you're going to say. Read a few books, right? 
Um, so in that sense, as writers for young people, do you make room in your stories and even as a, a public thinker or a public artist um, as a way to model behavior, uh, how do you let young people know that you don't know shit, <laughs> right? There is still room to grow, right? When we want to validate those young people's voices, when they are uh, the young woman from um, Florida with the shave hair, baby girl, yeah. right? Lovely, great, right? However, she is going to grow. She has to grow. She's a teenager. Whatever she's doing now, she may not be doing or thinking at 25. Mm -hmm. There is growth for the activist. There is growth for the artist. So how do you let your young readers know within your story, within uh, by being in schools or being at festivals, that I still don't know everything yet, right? And I still have more room to grow. That journey towards self-actualization, um, that, and we talk about often with activists, uh, self-care, right? But what about self-introspection, -intros you know, thinking quietly, wondering at the world, and doing those things that make you come to know? How do you come to know things? How do you come to understand things? The personal journey. Within my writing, I try to have my characters be always a little bit morally gray. So no protagonist is going to be right about everything. There's always going to they're always going to take some make some questionable decisions, have some questionable thoughts. The way I did when I was a teenager that I can now reflect on to sort of show that nobody has like 100% pure thoughts, right? In my life as an author, when I'm on Twitter or when I'm at a festival when I'm talking to a crowd. I try to be humble about what I don't know. I try to reflect upon any time that I'm wrong about something. If someone says something that I didn't realize before, instead of being quiet about it, I've started being like, oh, I didn't know this. Thank you for sharing that to try to model that we're always learning. That's something that I've, I've been trying more and more uh, to do recently, to like, when I learn something new, to be like, this was new to me. So it's okay for it to be new to you also. With the morally gray characters, I feel like I've hit a bit of a stumbling block and I'm actually curious to know what everyone else thinks. Um, I always have morally gray characters. I always want to portray really realistic characters. So a lot of my characters in Epic Love Story make a lot of mistakes. There's some cheating, for example, and there's some, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Um, but unfortunately, and I, do, you know, I don't know why I'm surprised by this, but I've seen some response be really um, kind of like vicious. So for example, one of the characters is a black girl. Is, are those responses going to be more vicious towards her because she's a black girl if she had been a white girl? Mm -hmm. So I begin to question, you know, I, I hate that I'm already starting to question it, but does that mean that my characters need to not be so morally gray now because people are going to be so much more harsh on them? Or right. is it that I need to just push back and continue showing these realistic characters regardless of how other people are going to react? Please show teenagers as they are, not how we wish them to be. And I think when I go out and talk online or talk to teens or go into schools, I tell them who I was as a teenager. I show them pictures. I was a mess. I was grumpy, entitled, stubborn. I had my idea about the world, and then it was shattered once I left the bubble that is my parents, right? And so those are the sort of the characters that I also write. Um, privileged, sheltered, little black girls who were raised by generations of people who came out of the segregated South that created a protective bubble of the next generation. And then when we left that bubble, the, our lives cracked, because that's how I felt. I was like, oh, there's racism here, okay. Um, I remember my first and third grade, some girl invited me over and she told me, oh, my mom lets colored people in the house. And I remember going home and being like, mom, Sarah said she lets colored people in the house. And she was like, well, you won't be going to Sarah's house and let's have a conversation. And so my bubble sort of burst. So I tend to write these, these characters, these black girls who have been sheltered from the world and then they have to sort of learn and get their armor um, for it. And I wanna give teens and people the space to make mistakes. I think we don't allow our teenage characters, especially our 
black girl characters to make mistakes. We hold them up. They're supposed to be more adult-like. They're seen as more adult-like. And so we hold them accountable. They're not allowed to be unlikable. They're not allowed to be villains. And I want to write teens as they are, the teenager I was, the stuff in my journals. I was a mess, um, hot mess. So I want other teens to know that that's OK, and that's a part of your process. You can be an adult and be a hot mess. I haven't done my taxes yet, and it's October. It's almost <laughs> November. You know, like I just want everyone to know that it's OK to like not have it all together. I got to get this extension, you know? I just want them to know that it's OK to be, to not have all the answers, to not have it together. I haven't done my laundry. You know what I mean? Like, things are really hard. So, and kids ask me a lot. In the Bells, I talk a lot about bodies and beauty and beauty standards. And a couple of uh, people kept asking me, a lot of girls kept asking me, well, do you feel okay about yourself now? Are you happy with your body? Are you happy with the way you look? And I said, not every day. And they were like, wait, it doesn't get better? I was like, <laughs> I still have adult acne. I still, like, my hair is a mess in the morning. Like, it's still a work in progress. And so I want them to know that it's, there's no pill that fixes it. There's no, like, there's no magic that fixes your life. I don't have a Hogwarts wand to just like put it all together. And that it's every day you have to wake up and decide and make decisions and do the best you can and give them that space. Some of us are given more space than others. The rest of us have to sort of have it all together all the time. In, um, in Haudenosaunee, Iroquois tradition, it is said that we are all made up of both the good mind and the twisted mind. And we have to look at ourselves to figure out which we're in at any moment. <laughs> and I often tell students that, you know, I just realized I was behaving as if I was in that twisted, confused, selfish, angry, greedy mind. And I need to be in the good mind. And to do that, I just got to unwind and go back in the other direction. So with my characters, I never start with a perfect character in anything I've written. I can't think of anything I've written where the character knows what she is doing from the start. In fact, often she's confused, she's lost, she's frightened. She doesn't know what's going to happen next. But as the story progresses, that journey is a journey of self-discovery, which I hope my reader is also taking at the same time that my protagonist is making her way through the universe. I think we do show our characters growth by virtue of writing a good story, a beginning, middle, and end. And as you know, we're supposed to show character growth in some way. Um, even if they are messy, there is some realization for the reader and maybe for the character that they are messy. And you know, that's the first step to what? Something, to healing, right? Um, you know, it's like saying I'm an al alcoholic. I, you know, we can say I am messy, I'm a messy teenager. Um, and we're going to open up open it up to questions, but before we do that, I'm going to ask the authors to complete two statements. And no statements mean a lot to me. Um, they help me understand uh, you know, the, uh, my fellow authors and the work that they do and the growth that they feel that they need to do. So I will start. Um, and the first statement is, I know this much is true. And it's along the lines of the hill that I'll die on. So based on the work that I've done um, as a grown up, as a writer, as a mother, as a black woman, I know this much is true. I know that black girls, dark skinned girls, kinky haired girls, wide nosed, thick lipped, high bootied girls around the globe are the most marginalized group in the world. And I've done the work, I've done the research, I've done the reading to know that this is true, other than the fact of being one myself and raising two daughters, and that's where my work springs from. Everything that I do, that's the center. And I am still working, the second statement is, I am still working to understand, and this is the journey that I'm on as an artist, as a person. I still do not understand, and I'm still working to understand uh, money and capitalism. And there's a lot to unpack there, and I'll just leave it at that. So I'll open up those two statements to my fellow panelists to answer, and then we're gonna open up to question, any question that you might have. Who wants first? I know that there are as many ways to be black as there are black people in the world, and I, 
that includes queer identity, that includes trans identity, there needs to be more visible stories um, so that people can see themselves reflected. And then the other one is? I'm still working I'm to still understand. working to understand. I have so many different identities. I'm still working to understand that not, that is okay that not every story includes all of my identities. It's impossible to tell a Caribbean story with a black person who's also trans and it's okay to not do that. <laughs> um, I know that it's really crucial that all authors of color uphold each other's books, it, especially in this time of, there are lots of arguments happening, there's a lot of identity policing happening, and I think it's really crucial until we get the representation that we need across the board, until we have so much representation that we can start to argue about the tiny nuances, we need to be elevating all voices so that we can show what a diverse world is like so that we can get each other more opportunities. I think authors of color need to step it up and, and show up for each other more. Um, and I'm still struggling to figure out um, how I should exist as a public figure, as an author, as an activist when I just want to crawl into a cave and work on my stories <laughs> <laughs> away from the whole world. Yes. You can do it for your cave. <laughs> um, the first statement is, I know this much, true, I know this much is true that black people are more than their pain, um, that there is so much joy, and unfortunately, sometimes the joy doesn't get the light, it doesn't get the shiny dollars, it doesn't get the billboards, but it's there, and those stories deserve the light too. Um, and that's the place that I try to write from. Um, wanting that for kids, for as many pain books, I want 10 joy. Um, the other one is I am working on, what is yeah. I'm working on figuring out if I'm actually an artist. I was talking to Emily about this over tea. I don't know if I am an artist. I was a teacher for a very long time. And I fell into writing as a form of activism because I didn't have things for my students to read that brought them joy. It was all of the sort of um, sad stuff. So I wanted to create stuff that was magic, stuff that was just about love and kissing and saving the world. So I'm still trying to figure out if I'm actually an artist. Some of us are storytellers in our bones and always saw themselves as artists and I never saw myself as an artist. So I'm still trying to figure out, I don't think I am, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I think I'm a person who writes. <laughs> Thank you, thank you everyone. Those were some, I know I, I did, get a, did a deep dive with those questions and y'all y'all came through with it. Thank you very much. Now we will open it up to any questions whatsoever. We have about 10 minutes. We could take a few questions. Anybody, yes. Okay, so can you, can you um, please speak up okay. so people in the back can hear you. So my question's for Danielle. Oh, hi. Hi. Danielle. Danielle, sorry. Okay. So, Hey girl, hey. Yeah. And so my question for you is how do you, um, is there a way to separate being a teacher and an activist? Or like being a black, a black educator and an activist? I don't think so. <laughs> I felt like when I was a teacher and a librarian that it, that that was my activism. Showing up every day for those children, making sure that I found something to in to get their eyes on print, that's what I would say. Find something, eyes on print. Um, something to inspire them. I don't think there's a way to not, to, to separate those two. I think it's part of the job, it's part of the work, or for me it was. It's why I do what I do, because I was surrounded by those little people um, who were so excited just to see me that I felt like I needed to fill them up and give them the breadcrumbs and send them on their way so that they could have a relationship with literacy and story and be excited about coming to school, even though when they left their house in the morning, they had to deal with all kinds of things as they traversed New York City to get to East Harlem to come see me. I don't think there is a way for me. I think it's, they go together. Because to be a teacher, you have to push against so many things um, in order to show up every day. Low wages, 
drama, bad infrastructure. So I think there's no way. I think it's they go together. Excellent. Thank you for that question. One and two. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Oh. Oh, thank you. Um, the, the question I have is about activism. As a writer myself, I took after the James Baldwin kind of spiritual mentor and being a playwright and an essayist and all of those different things. But it seems now, going back to what was said, the sad stories have won out. So um, is there, I'm looking for the diversity among activism. It seems like some activism is better than other activism. And as an activist myself, I'm push, I'm being, I, I, I like to write about empowered figures. And it seems like the sad stories, the, you know, we're gonna die in the end, you know, how cruel life is and the joy that we don't, we have, but we don't really see. It seems there's within diversity, there seems to be this sense that that story of sadness and pain and, and, and hurt is, seems to be like the, the ideal true story of struggle. I feel this question very strongly because that is why I wrote Epic Love Story. It is a rom-com where you know that there's a happily ever after yeah. and I decided to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to write it through resistance through joy. The idea that everything that Danielle was saying is just, we, are, we have only, historically queer people of color have basically only had the story of we are going to die literally. That's the way the books have always ended. So to write, so I did purposely write this and I do think that there are more coming out. What if it's us just came out and that features a queer person of color as the main character as well. So I think that this is starting to change. Danielle I know was also writing through joy. So I think that this is changing. For me personally, I was writing different types of stories. My, my debut novel, American Street, was not the first story I wanted to tell. I've been trying to publish for over 10 years. The first book I sent out was a middle grade fantasy book um, that was about little fairies in the subway. Um, it, it wasn't great, but it was, it was not pain, it was not uh, sadness. But um, interestingly enough, uh, American Street is the first book that got me through, through the door. Um, and I think a many, for many of us, it's getting in through the door and it's not the single story, it's not the only story we want to tell, even if our first de debut novels um, tell those kinds of stories. But I, I had a pride as a love story, my life is an ice cream sandwich is funny as hell. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a matter of, I think a lot of actors, if you pay attention to Hollywood, Black actors get these like really stereotypical roles and then they're able to open up doors for the other actors and other people and have more roles and more diversity. I don't know, I think it's a money thing, one of those things I don't understand. I don't understand why pain is so profitable. Is right? It, may I ask a follow-up then? Yes. Do you think the publishing company is still like behind the idea that black life is pain, people of color are in pain always, and our lives are miserable, so it's like, you know, that's what they're used to seeing. If you write something right. that's positive, they don't think it's real. Right. I think that you're hit it, you hit it on the nail. I think about it all the time, though. I'm like, maybe I should write a black pain book and get a payday. Yep. I think about it every time I start a new book. I'm not, I'm not BSing. I think about it every single time. I call it the rock and moan books. Yes. Where you rock I'm like, moan. why don't I write my YA The Help? Maybe if I write my YA The Help, I can, you know. The, the thing is, people of color want to see these diverse stories. Diverse not in terms of like, I mean, obviously within ethnicity, but, but more than that, people want to see the, the fairy tales featuring people who look like themselves. The problem is that publishing is so white, that publishing is centering the stories that these people have, you know, it's whatever, whatever people have internalized, uh, whatever they think. They think it's going to be profitable because they grew up seeing all the same narratives, right? Work. And hopefully, publishing is becoming more diverse. There are more grants out there. Support, it's really hard to get into publishing. It's a lot of the time it's people of higher privilege who can afford to work in publishing because publishing does not pay well. And there are more grants and more scholarships out there supporting young people entering publishing, supporting people of color, people of all marginalizations, hopefully over the next several decades. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to say, say one thing in here, too, that uh, I plead guilty to happy endings in some of my books. And uh, also, I think that humor is really important. 
that we forget is a, an African writer friend of mine, um, Chino Achebe, said, uh, the drum laughs and the drum cries, both. And that if we forget humor, we forget a big part of it. I have a series of post-apocalyptic novels, The Killer of Enemies. The main character says, a Chiricahua Apache woman whose job it is to kill genetically modified monsters in a world that has lost electricity. And there are a lot of funny things that happen in the story, even though it's you know, really a difficult time. And it's not like uh, The Walking Dead, where there is no laughter, and where every black character gets killed eventually. <laughs> Uh, it's a world that we need to recognize, a world of diverse emotions, that humor has to be part of what we do too. And we can have happy endings in our stories. And this is not to invalidate the pain, the, the books that describe our pain. The more I travel to different places across the country, I pay attention to the black people in different states, in different cities, and I think we're hurting. I think there is, I truly believe in this idea of post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, oh, yeah. Dr. Joy DeGray talks about where we still, there still needs to be a lot of healing, right? A lot of healing work, a lot of healing fictions of, as Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, um, she named something called the healing fictions. But I think it's the joy immersed in that pain. I think it's the writer has to, if you're going to write a, a painful book, bring in some joy, and I think a lot of books do do that, but there needs to be some balance. There absolutely needs to be some balance. Any, thank you for that question. Any questions? Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, there was a number two? Who was number two? Hat. Number two and number three. Uh, hey, Hat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sakvasi. <laughs> thank you guys for putting this time together. It's really great. Um, Danielle? Mm -hmm. Mention something well, a lot of things. One is talking about writing from a place of pain. Um, I had a book published, uh, a memoir by Harper Collins, and what's the title? What's the title? Storm of Hope. Okay. I have a second book coming out, but I've always felt like, man, how did this happen? I'm not, I'm not a writer. I knew that I've been a storyteller all my life, and that storytelling is how I'm changing the world in a sense. But I'm not always comfortable around people like yourself who went to school for writing, who wrote forever, you know, I've met people like, hey, I've been writing for 20 years and I can't publish a book. And then I'm like, oh, I got my second book coming out. And I always feel weird about that. Um, and also writing from a place of pain, I really wish I could write about growing up in Long Island and my mother had money and my dad was this. And that's not the place I'm from, from a place of pain. My mom wasn't there. My dad grew up for, that's the world I'm from and that's the world I write from. Um, but at times I try to write about a different world even though I did not have that world. And I find a lot of beauty in that pain. I think that the person I am today comes from a lot of the journeys and experiences that I've had. So, you know, can you guys kind of, you pretty much touched on that. But if you can talk a little bit more about that journey in terms of someone like myself who just got into writing term for that? There is a term. Imposter for that. syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Imposter syndrome. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Not me. No. <laughs> no. Meaning that I um I think I am one of those people who worked hard and when I did get published, I'm like, well, it's about time. Um, <laughs> so anybody, any new writers who kind of stumbled into writing and how do you deal with the success of not having written for 20 years and then here you are. Any, anybody? No? Nope. I didn't start writing until I was in grad school and I was forced to. I wanted to be a librarian. I got my master's in children's literature. I was just going to be a teacher. And they forced me to take a creative writing class. And when I was studying the canon of children's literature, I saw there were so many kids missing. And I saw that black American children had giants, great literary giants to stand on. But I realized that I wanted even more. I was a kid who read a book every day, four or five books a week. And I wanted magic and kissing and all the other stuff on top of you know the painful stuff. Um, so in terms of imposter syndrome, I think the imposter syndrome that I have is what figuring out if I'm an actual artist, if this is just my life's work as a teacher, as trying to get children's eyes on print, trying to get them to connect, trying to give them a variety of different kinds of stories that all kids deserve magic. All kids deserve to see themselves kissed senselessly, right, on the page. 
get romance. And I think that it's just me figuring out what, what that term means. So that's, I think, my imposter syndrome. How about writing from a piece, writing from pain when you've always, that, well, that's the only thing that you know. I, right. I want to say something to that because yeah, you, you, know, you may have had certain experience or any writer, any one of us may have had some painful childhood or teenhood experiences, but I think the joy in that journey is that you get to write about it, yeah. you get to publish it, you get to share your story with the world, and that process in itself um, ought to be healing not only for you, but for your readers. So I, I think that, like, that, that, that's the joy. Yeah. It's not just, if, if there's pain within your pages, I think you bring the joy when you get to contextualize it and you stand in front of young people and you stand at a library at an event like this and you talk about your journey. Here's my pain in this book, but here's my joy. I'm here standing in front of you talking about my pain and I've healed from it. So I, always, I never like to separate the book from the author. Yeah. Um, the book and author are one and the same, and, I, and that's why I enjoy like in-person things like this, where you see the whole person and the whole journey. Mm -hmm. I feel like the conversation that was happening before, or what I was hearing was that pain should not be the only narrative. It's not, right. it's not at all like E.B. was saying, it's not at all to invalidate any of it, but just that we need more than just one narrative, and I think, you should write whatever calls to you because we are we all become writers whether you identify as an a writer or an artist or not we become writers because we're grappling with something mm -hmm. and we put the words down on the paper to better understand our own thoughts and so i think if that's if those are your thoughts write it and the pain is important what i meant was when the publishing industry only publishes painful novels about little black boys and i'm a librarian and i'm with a library full of little black boys and some of them want magic they want to know what gods they come from and have a book like rick gordon you know percy jackson and i don't have anything for them that's a problem for me where they don't get to see a multitude of experience they don't get to save the world that's unfair and so that's when I, when I critique that, that's what I mean. I'm critiquing the system and sort of not allowing a multitude of different kinds of stories with characters that look like us on the page for our children. Actually, I was just thinking of something which is a little bit of an aside, but uh, there's a wonderful documentary called A Place to Stand, which tells the story of Jimmy Santiago Baca, who was an inmate in prison in Arizona who could not read or write who taught himself to read by reading poetry, who became a leading poet in America and who was released from prison and is quite well known as a writer and a teacher. This documentary, I think, is inspiring because it talks about that place of pain that he came from and how he, through writing, discovered himself through poetry, freed himself from the prison of his mind as well as the physical prison he was in. It's called A Place to Stand and it was done by his son and another producer's name I'm forgetting. But it's really a wonderful story. And to me, it says a lot about the writer's journey for all of us. Thank you. Do we have one more question here somewhere? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Um, I really liked your comment about there are as many ways to be black as there are black people in the world. Are there as many ways to be white? And could the white people in this audience have more in common with every one of you than we ever will with Republicans in power. <laughs> because we don't identify Justine? with them, we identify with you and, and your beautiful words for which we thank you. Uh, I think the basic, I think there's a statement in there where we're all human. Well, is it? No? My question is, are there, you said uh, beautifully that there are as many ways to Co be Corinthian mm -hmm. as there are black people in the world. Are there as many ways to be white as there are white people? I'm, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. I, I think whiteness is a prison um, that yeah. white people created. It's made up. <laughs> it's, it's made up. up. It's it, and dominance. right. It's made up to create. Privilege. Yes, um, and it is a social uh, construct. We know this. Um, there was an article somewhere about, um, and Haiti has this experience, um, has this history too, where Irish. Oh, yeah. The Irish were right there with the exactly. African slaves, and we I know that personally from how Vodou mythology has been have, has has been created. A lot of our Vodou gods come from Celtic gods um, and Irish Catholic gods, and the, you know they were right there in the fields wherever we were. 
Um, so at some point, the Irish became white. The Italians became white. And I know that from my DNA. From your DNA? <laughs> who you yes. got? Who you got up in there? Irish, Italian, yes. who? Right, 25%. Because right, <laughs> my right. family was owned by Irish people on mm -hmm. both sides. Right. So that's why I lost my right. color. <laughs> I think, um, you know, there are physically, there is physical, there are physical differences. Um, of course, ethnic, racial, racial, no. We look different, you know, we have different tr uh, traditions and customs, but that system of dominance, that system of hierarchy, that, that idea that says people who look this way or come from this history or come from this culture, somebody made that up. That is simply not true. Uh, so yes, we do have a lot in common, um, but if you choose to believe that hierarchical structure, that is the prison of your own making. Yeah, I have a question. I'm wondering uh, what can we do to create this diverse uh, publishing world that we want to live in? I'd like to know some suggestions. Besides, besides being a writer yourself, what can you do to be to make this world that we all say we want so many diverse books? How do we do that? Buy the books. <laughs> Buy the books. Teach the books. Teach the books. Make Unpack sure schools them. have yes. them. Yes. Pay attention to the ratio of white writers that you're reading to authors of color that you're reading. It's so easy, so easy to go have a year go by and the vast majority of books that you read are by white writers. You know, it, keep a list, keep track. Every time you're asked to recommend books, make sure that you're recommending books by authors of color, books by women, books by people of all marginalized identities. And I mean, try to support people getting into publishing who don't look like the default read beyond the loud so the ones that are always trotted out the ones that always have the shine the ones that publishing has paid to put on the front line read look beyond those for yeah. some of us that are in the back right exactly look to the back of the boat look widely once you've done i feel like sometimes we put certain books on sort of our diversity 101, our sort of woke checklist. And once we read past our woke checklist, we don't do a deep dive further. And it's like, keep getting past the first sort of 101. Oh, oh, okay. One last question because your pen and then we're gonna wrap it up. Yes. And then if you have any questions, be feel free to come up to us. Yeah, yeah actually I wanted to ask a question for everyone. Uh, and um, what are you working on? And or where can we see you next? Let's go down the line right here. A lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet, so I'll list my books. Um, <laughs> anthology, um, Black Enough, there are many different ways to be black. Uh, Danielle is uh, one of the contributors. Uh, and uh, My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich comes out in August. It's set in 1984 Harlem about a little girl who really wants to go to outer space, but the girls in the hood will not let her. Um, a couple of books I'm not allowed to talk about just yet, but the, where you can see me next is my launch for this is kind of an epic love story, which is going to be Books of Wonder next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Cool. The downtown one, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm working on another book and I'm on deadline right now, which means I really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm also a co-creator of Foreshadow, which you should check out at foreshadowya.com. Um, it is a serial anthology that's published digitally. We just released issue zero, which featured Danielle Clayton. And issue one starts in January 2019. We are working really hard to create a digital short story platform where we've we're paying everyone, we're paying all our contributors, we're paying all the people involved, but you all get to read the short stories for free. And we're trying really hard to elevate voices that aren't usually heard. So please check us out. And please submit, those of you who are writers, if you're writing young adult short stories, please send us your work. We want to read it, we're hungry for it. it was I remember an one of my publishers screaming in my ear, yes. Joseph, you missed an opportunity. Yes. <laughs> So I will say that book three in the Unicorn Rescue Society series, Sasquatch and the Muckle Shoot, which I co-authored, is coming out next month. Good. <laughs> um, I have the second book in my Bell series called The Everlasting Rose that comes out in March of next year. 
Um, and then I have a book that I co-wrote with my writing partner, Sona Charapatra, called The Rumor Game. It follows three girls in the destructive path of a rumor um, in sort of the DC political suburbs. Uh, coming out, mm, I think, 2020. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. your question. Thank you, E.B. And books are for sale. And we'll be here to sign and answer any more questions um, if you need to. Thank you again. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you.